Hello and welcome to our Office Hours presentation for today. This is your host, Paul Hoyt. Our Office Hours presentation is a relaxed, informal mentoring program that we hold every Monday at noon Pacific time. All these recordings, slides, and exercises are archived in our members area, and all the recordings are available, at least for now, on my YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Paul Hoyt. The reasons we do these Office Hours presentations is that we know that being a successful small business owner can be a fantastic experience, but we also know that it's tough. You need education, training, tools, and team in order to be successful, and we want you to get to know us, because when you get to know us, you'll know that first and most importantly, we really do care about you. We want you to succeed in every area of your life, whatever that means to you. We want you to find the greatness the happiness, the divinity that you have within yourself, and then remember it, embrace it, and live it every single day as we try to do. Our passion is to increase the survival rate, accelerate the growth rate, and reduce the struggle rate of businesses in America, and our vision is to help millions of CEOs and entrepreneurs accelerate their business growth and enjoy greater harmony and balance in their lives. If you find these Office Hours presentations beneficial to you in any way, then please pass the word. Every one of you out there knows someone who's in business, and maybe they have a tremendous opportunity that they're taking advantage of, or maybe they're struggling in some way, or maybe they're just enjoying business going along in a steady growth mode, or just kind of rock solid month to month to month. In either case, you know, there is an opportunity for them to learn and grow and get some support. And please pass around, you know, please pass along the information that our office hours presentation is available to them. We certainly would appreciate it. Our office hours agenda is an in-depth discussion of a business success principle. Then we offer some closing remarks, special offers, and an invitation for next week's session. Then we go into open Q&A and coaching. And for those of you who are live on the call, the best question or comment wins. So type your questions into the chat box when you think about them or your topics of discussion into the chat box. And at the end of the converse, into the presentation today, when we finish with our Q&A, we'll pick somebody who can win a prize based on the best question or the best topic of discussion. Throughout the week, we encourage you to join us in the Awaken CEO communities on both LinkedIn and Facebook where well, we publish a business success principle of the day a few days a week on both Facebook and LinkedIn. And every morning I get up and post an energy of the day posting on Facebook. Today was day number 1052 in a row. Today's topic is working with contractors, getting the help that you need. As always, we relate the subject matter of the day to one or more of the key performance areas of success. And today it's about leadership, about you taking responsibility and understanding how you work with contractors, but it's also about financial management because with because the relationship with contractors and employees is a key part of the financial operations of your business. With the awakened CEO system, we talk a lot about the three uh, areas of growth, business growth, professional growth, and personal growth, and the three levels of performance, mindset, methods, and momentum, and relate the subject matter of the day to one or more of those nonets, one or more of those different areas. And today we're going to talk about the mindset of, of growing your business and growing yourself professionally and growing yourself personally with regards to subcontractors and offer some methods that you can use for business growth and professional growth as well. Our agenda for today is we're going to talk about teamwork, contractors versus employees, common mistakes that people make whenever they're engaging with contractors, the perfect storm, best practices in engaging with and managing contractors, and sum it all up to the bottom line. First of all, let's talk a little bit about teamwork. It re you've all heard the expression, that it takes a village to raise a child. And by the way, it really does take a village to raise a child because we humans, as it turns out, a single mother with an infant, you know, cannot supply enough calories for herself and her infants by herself. She really does need support from somebody, from a family or from an entire village in order to safely raise a child. 
And much like it takes a village to raise a child, it does take a team to start and grow a business. There is no such thing as a solopreneur. I know we hear that expression a lot, but there is really no such thing as a solopreneur. Everybody in business has to have a team. There really is no choice. You have to work with contractors in some way to provide valuable assistance, to provide expertise that you don't have, to provide bandwidth that you don't have, to free up your time so that you can do more value-focused activities within your business. So if you're thinking of yourself as being a soloist in the business, throw that think thought away. Don't even have that thought. Think of yourself as, as leading a team, of conducting an orchestra, if you will, and recruiting and hiring people and telling them what to do and showing them what to do to help you grow your business, to help you achieve your dreams. Sometimes we do that in forms of contractors and sometimes we do that in the form of employees. And it really is a big decision at your business whether you work with contractors or employees or both. Eventually, as you grow your business, I think you will need both of them, but you can grow reasonably large without having any employees at all, without having an official employee relationship with anybody. But soon, you're going to need at least part-time employees. You're going to find it effective and efficient and very cost-effective for you to have at least part-time employees. Let's talk about employees for a second. Because employees requires having a payroll system and paying several kinds of taxes. There are liabilities, legal responsibilities that you, that you are encumbered with whenever you have employees. It does require a lot of additional complexity in your internal systems to make sure that employees are properly compensated, to make sure that taxes are properly paid, to make sure that you're in, uh, informing your employees of their rights, etc. And, and also, the totally fully burdened cost of an employee can be a bit of a surprise to some people. It can be 25 to 50 percent higher than their wage or salary. At a minimum, you've got 6.2 percent you know, federal or FICA tax that goes along with every employee wage. But there are oftentimes a lot of other costs of having employee, the cost of of providing them materials and supplies, the cost of providing them training, the cost of providing them with the things that they need to do the job for you that add to that. And the fully burdened cost of an employee can be 25 to 50 percent higher than the wage or salary that you pay them. And they might have, by the way, surprise rights. Oftentimes, states give their employees a lot of, of rights that you are responsible for understanding and that you are responsible for passing along to your employees. So whenever you did make the decision to have an employee in your state, make sure you've got somebody on your team, probably a contractor, who will assist you in making sure that you understand the rights of employees in your state so that you can uh, properly follow those rights and pass along the benefits that you need to benefit, you need to pass along, and the information that you need to pass along to your employees. Contractors are different. Con with contractors, you can have very simple agreements. There's much less complexity whenever you're dealing with contractors. The costs are usually pretty well defined, and it's easier to hold a contractor accountable, and it's easier to replace contractors. But it's almost always more expensive to work with contractors. And that's why, by the way, that we work with employees. We work with employees primarily because they're less expensive to contractors and there's a loyalty factor as well. But you do have to, again, watch out for the surprise rights that employees have. For example, some states are right to work states and some states are not right to work state. If you're in a state that that really defends employees extremely well with the right to work. You may find that if you have employed somebody as a W-2 employee for more than 90 days or so, that you may it may take you 90 days to let them go. You may have to have formal notices to them of, of unsatisfactory job performance, and you may have to do that for a number of months before you're even 
quote, allowed to terminate their employment, especially if it's for poor performance. Now, if somebody, somebody has issues with, you know, breaking laws, if somebody has issues with not following employee guidelines set forth in an employee handbook, then I think you have greater rights than that. But you do have to watch it for your particular state to make sure that you're managing the employees right. Not so with contractors. With, with contractors, it's a lot easier. So, but one of the big questions that people ask me all the time is how do I tell the difference? How do I tell whenever somebody is an employee versus a contractor for my particular business? When do I have to give them payroll, put them on a payroll? When do I have to accord to them all those rights? Well, as it turns out, the IRS has 10 different guidelines when it comes to understanding the difference in between employees and contractors. I'm going to run through all 10 of these really quickly. And then we're going to go into how you can how you can employ contractors in the best possible way. The 10 guidelines that the IRS offers are number one is somebody's a contractor if they control what is done and how it is done. If you are micromanaging them, if you're saying do this and here's exactly how you should do it, then the IRS may think that they have a tendency to be an employee rather than a contractor. A contractor typically brings their own tools and equipment. If you're providing tools and equipment to your contractor, the IRS might think that they're an employee. The, uh, the, the contractor typically will decide who they employ for assistance, who they hire as a subcontractor. But if you're telling them who they need to work with, then the IRS might consider them to be an employee. Typically, an IR, uh, a contractor purchases their own supplies, and they provide their own training. If you're providing supplies, and if you're training your contractors, the IRS might say, you know, they really were an employee. The other five are, typically a contractor will have a significant personal investment in providing the services to you, that they've bought their own training, that they have their own tools and equipment, that they run their own offices, et cetera. But in other words, they have a significant personal investment in providing the services to your particular company. They may also have unreimbursed expenses, and if they have an opportunity for profit or loss, then the IRS says they're a contractor versus an employee. If they make their services generally available to the market, in other words, if they are working for somebody other than just you, and if they've got three or four or five clients, the IRS might consider them to be a contractor instead of employee. And the contractors are oftentimes project-based. In other words, you're hiring them for a very, a very specific job for a fixed amount of time at a fixed price. And if they do all of these 10 things, then they're clearly a contractor. If they do most of these 10 things, then they're probably clearly a contractor. If they're only doing one or two of these things, the IRS might consider them to be an employee and can come back to you and suggest that you owe the state government, that you owe the IRS the, uh, the, the tax associated with them, the FICA tax, the Social Security tax for them, and, and you might have to uh, suffer fines and penalties associated with it. My big key, by the way, which is not in the IRS guidelines, is do they have their own company? Because if you're hiring a company instead of somebody who's working as a sole proprietor, to me, you're almost always off the hook unless you are in some way in collusion with that person that says, hey, if you'll set up your own LLC or if you'll set up your own incorporation and you'll bear the expense of that, I'll be able to hire you as a contractor and that's going to save you money and me money, et cetera, et cetera which is, I don't, I don't know, I've ever heard of that actually happening. So if you're hiring a company, if somebody is sending an invoice to you in the form of a company, as opposed to just an invoice from them as an individual, then you, I think you're off the hook. You can be assured that they are a contractor. But if they're sending you an invoice for them personally, 
then you really have to pay attention to these 10 other IRS guidelines as to whether or not they're an employee or whether or not they are a contractor. So pay attention to that list. If you're engaging the services of somebody who does not have a company, make sure that you're, you're giving them independent responsibilities, that you're hiring them on a project basis, that they have their own, uh, they have autonomy, that they're providing their own supplies, that they're providing their own training, et cetera, so that the IRS and the state governments don't come back and, and tell you on down the road that, hey, they really were an employee and you owe us money because they were really an employee. When it comes to engaging the services of contractors, I've seen people make a lot of mistakes. And frankly, I've made some of these mistakes myself. Some of those mistakes are in picking the wrong expert and not doing due diligence. We'll cover that here in a little bit and making sure that you've got the right person on your team because, hey, you really didn't know what a marketing uh, expert looked like or you didn't know what a good bookkeeper looked like, etc. You can pay too much for contractors, um, especially if somebody senses that you're not checking out you know, all of the different possibilities. If they sense that they're not in competition, there are some unscrupulous contractors out there that will just you know, charge you the, the most that they possibly can. You can hire contractors who only provide partial solutions. You know, you wanted to, for example, get a website and you hired somebody to get a website only to find out that they don't generate any of the content. All they're going to do is take your content and put it in the website and you had to either provide the content to them or hire somebody else to provide copywriting. By the way, that's a very common mistake when you hire somebody to create a website, you have to make sure that they're providing the content or at least you understand who's providing the content for their website. You can have very bad agreements that provide them with a lot of rights and don't provide you with any rights under the engagement. And sometimes contractors will push for very large long-term agreements and that can be good or it can be bad, but, you, but really you want to make sure that you're doing your due diligence especially when there's a lot at risk for large long-term agreements, and we'll do more of that. But the most common mistake that I see people make is that they're being out of sequence. They, they get engaged in a conversation. They really like what somebody has to say, but that contract is right for a phase two or phase three. It's really not helping them move the business forward dramatically and accelerate the growth of the business over the next 90 days or so. I have seen some contractors get, you know, some rather CEOs and entrepreneurs get caught up in a perfect storm. And here's what the perfect storm looks like. They get a lot of encouragement to start a business and make it really big. They get somebody to really help them tap into their own dreams and they get caught up in this, wow, wouldn't it be cool if I could do this and I could make $10 million doing this or $100 million doing this or if my programs, my services really got took off and they got a viral wave and, and I was able to be a billionaire. But unfortunately, many businesses are very, very complex and most owners are very ill-prepared and very undertrained, and they take the job of starting and growing their business without even knowing what the job are. And unfortunately, many, many talented consultants move up market. What this means is that people who really get caught up in the passion of it, they don't understand what the complexity of it is. They don't understand that it's fairly rare to find an extremely competent consultant who deals effectively with startups and they make some bad decisions and worst of all, they get caught up with predators. There are some contractors out there who are eager to take a lot of your money without knowing what your growth strategy is, without knowing how much resources you actually have to employ with contractors, without knowing your overall budget, without having any skin in the game at all, and they are very, very good at sales. I have seen way too many predators in the marketplace look somebody in the eye and say, you know, I really think that you're going to be successful in this business. 
I think that you're going to make it really big. I think that you can have a $5 million or a $10 million business. I really believe in you. And if you really believed in yourself, you would write me a check right now for $30,000 because I am the right person to help you move forward. To me, that is the closest thing to being god-awful evil in this marketplace that I've ever seen, and I've seen it lots and lots of times. People who are very, very good at sales that try to encourage you to get engaged with a $5,000, a $10,000, a $30,000, a $50,000 engagement, preying upon the trust and the ignorance of other people without really being concerned about what they really need, what they can really afford, and what they can really use just selling them things as much as they possibly can, as quickly as they possibly can. The good news is that there's really only a few predators in the marketplace. It's really only the top maybe two to five percent of people that are predators, that want to sell you that $10,000, that $30,000, that $50,000 engagement right off the bat. Um, but you got to watch out for those people. You really do have to work, watch out for those people. It is your responsibility as the CEO and the entrepreneur of your, of your business to determine your overall budget, to define the sequence for building your business, and to make really good decisions on who you hire, when you hire them, how much you pay them, and how, much, how you manage the, the engagement. We talked earlier about being a solopreneur, and there really is no such thing as a solopreneur, you will, in the course of your business, need to buy a lot of services, administrative assistance, marketing services, coaching and mentoring services, sales support services, and training services are among the most common ones. And it really is up to you to be very strategic because you can't do all of everything at once. Unless you are extremely well-funded, unless you have $100,000 in the bank account, unless you have $200,000 in the bank account, unless you've got a sugar daddy somewhere, you simply can't do everything at once. It doesn't make sense for you to start out on day one of your business and buy the services from all of these contractors at once because you can't afford everybody at once and you can't use everybody at once. I think it's real important for you to have a growth plan and a budget and I really strongly recommend the 80-20 rule until you reach some sort of a financial stability with some very limited exceptions. There are some cases where you don't want to apply the 80-20 rule. And for those of you who are kind of new to that, that means that you're looking for 80% of the value at 20% of the cost or expense, which you can apply in a lot of circumstances. There are some cases when you don't want to do that, off the top of my head, uh, securities attorneys and intellectual properties attorneys. Because if, if you have an idea that is patentable, you want to make sure that you're dealing with somebody reliable and paying somebody only 20% of what a true professional would cost you in terms of securities law, and in terms of intellectual property law, probably is not a good decision. But there are many other cases where you can get 80% of the value for 20% of the expense. We can talk about some of those when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the discussion section at the end of this presentation, if you like. But when you are strategic, when you, it is time for you to reach out, I strongly recommend that you employ best practices in hiring and have a step-by-step -step success formula for hiring employees and for hiring contractors. If you haven't done so already, this chart comes from my course on the Business Survival Boot Camp, where we introduce this five-step process that I'm going to go over with you right now, which is, by the way, this, the five-step process or six-step process that the military uses and that corporate America uses to make sure that they're making the very best decisions they can on hiring employees and hiring contractors and I really strongly encourage you to use it in your business as well. Here are the step by step. We define the work to be done. We interview several candidates for that work. We check their references and do background checks as appropriate. We take a probationary mindset and we have frequent 
progress meetings in order to manage the engagement. First of all, we define the work to be done. We have detailed requirements, we have a firm budget for the work that needs to be done, and we have a definite time frame. Here's some examples of that. For example, I need to have a financial model completed by next Tuesday, and my upper limit for this engagement is $3,000. We know exactly what we want, we know when we want it, and we have a budget associated with it. Or I need an initial branding strategy and implementation by the end of the month, and my budget is $5,000. Or I want a coaching relationship for the next year, and my budget is $1,000 a month. In each one of these three examples, we have we have defined what it is that we need to do, we have defined the time frame that needs to be done, and we have the budget. You would not know this, by the way, unless you had some sort of a strategic growth plan in place for your business. If you knew the sequence with which you needed to get things done, which gives you the sequence with which you hire the contractors. If you had a budget in place to get the things done that you need to get done, that that Therefore, it gives you a budget that you can use with each one of your contractors. So the first step is to have a, have a strategy in place, a growth strategy in place, and then you can have the strategy wherewith you define the work that needs to be done by, by when you need it to be done and a budget for that. After you have made that de definition, then we encourage you to interview several candidates, and we strongly encourage you to use the three expert rule. The three expert rule, for those of you who have listened to these office hours presentations before, this is one of my favorite rules that I made up. The three expert rule says that when you don't know what you are doing, when you have, we don't have specific domain expertise and you don't know what an expert looks like or how much an expert charges for their services, apply the three expert rule and here it is very simply. With the three expert rule, you interview three experts. You see what they have to say. You get proposals from those three experts and you, and you compare the proposals. When you compare the proposals, you'll find out how long they think it's gonna take, how much they think it's gonna cost, and if they're all kind of within the same five or 10% guidelines, you know, they all say that hey, the, I, we can have this done within the next couple of weeks. If somebody says it's going to be 3,000, somebody else 4,000, somebody says 5,000, you know, you're roughly in the same ballpark. If when you talk to them, they're talking about the same kinds of process, then you know that you have some consistency and you can safely make a decision based upon the lowest price, based upon the person that you connect with the most, based upon the person that you think is really going to give you the quality that you want, etc. If they are wildly disparate, somebody says it's going to cost $2,500, somebody says it's going to cost $10,000, and somebody else says it's going to cost $50,000. If someone says it's going to take one week, and somebody says it's going to take three weeks, and somebody says it's going to take three months, then you know you have no agreement among the experts whatsoever, and it's important for you to go find three more experts or refine your questioning and go back to them until you find some sort of a consensus so that you know that these are what the experts are saying. And that's what the three expert rule is saying. Look for consensus, look for some agreement between the first three experts that you talk to, and if you can't find that consensus and agreement, then go find three more experts and talk to them. And think about the three C's that are necessary when it comes to interviewing the, the candidates. Chemistry, character, and competence. Competence we can tell from the experience that they have and the way that they engage in the, in the conversation that we have. Character we can tell by the conversation and by the references. And chemistry is about how well that you feel like you're getting along with them and whether or not you feel like you can have a great relationship and whether or not they really care about you. So focus on those three C's whenever you interview the candidates. And I think it's important to have them interviewed by someone else on your team who has successfully hired contractors before and who cares about their success. By the way, that's a job that I do with a lot of people that I work with, is that when they're looking at making a great employment decision, bringing somebody on 
temporarily or permanently, when they're looking at engaging in a very large contract, when they're looking at bringing on somebody, especially to be a CFO or something like that, that you know, I get an opportunity to interview them on behalf of my clients to give them a third party perspective so that they can make a great decision on who they hire. The third step in the process is to check the references and their background. And here's a general guideline that says the greater the risk that you have, the more carefully you should check the references and their background. People who are professional contractors should be able to provide you three references and samples of their work products very, very quickly. It shouldn't take them weeks to come up with three people that you can talk to. We should, they should be able to come up with it you know, by the close of business today. You know, and, and by the way, that's what I encourage you to say. Can you provide three references to me by the close of business today? Because if they're really a professional in business, they will be able to do that. And also, don't forget about criminal background checks and civil litigation checks whenever you're hiring people, especially those who are handling money at your business. And if they supply an agreement to you, make sure you go over that agreement word for word you know, with them and with your attorney if necessary if the agreement is not in plain English. I really like agreements that are in plain English, but we do find a lot of legal ease in the agreements. And if you have any sense of confusion at all, hire an attorney to go over it with you. It's going to be worth the four or five hundred bucks or even more that it takes, that it's going to cost you to, to work with an attorney to go through that agreement. Once you have, are determined that you have the right person, that you're comfortable that this person is an expert, that they, they can do the job, that they have great references, that you've checked them out three ways from Sundays, then even then when you engage their services, take a probationary mindset. Ask for installment payments to conserve your cash flow and to give you an out in the engagement. For medium contracts, you know, it's common to have 50% down and 50% on delivery. For larger contracts, you may split those payments into various milestones based upon the performance that they give you with some sort of hold back at the end. By the way, that's real common in large construction contracts that you pay people so much down, so much, say, when the foundation is poured, so much when the walls are up, so much when the framing is complete and the roof is on, so much when you know all of the electrician and plumbing stuff is done, et cetera, with a hold back at the end, typically five to 10% based upon overall satisfaction and completion of the deal. You can do the same thing with service contracts as well to take that probationary installment payment kind of contract. Once you have engaged a contractor at your company, then you can have frequent progress meetings to make sure that everything is on track and stays on track. It's real important for you to assign someone at each company to be responsible for the overall relationship. If that's not you, then somebody at your team to be responsible for those overall relationships with weekly, minima, weekly meetings at a minimum and progress reports with some demonstration of the success that they have made you know, on a, on a monthly basis or a weekly basis are really quite normal. Other base practices that you might have are avoid equity compensation at least at first. I had some people you know, recommend that, hey, here's my fee. You need to hire me for a year. The fee is going to be $30,000 and I get 5% of your company. Um, if you're going to engage in a contract like that, then you know, by all means do your due diligence. It's not always the bad thing to do, but it is a pretty terrible thing to do about 90% of the time. So when you find yourself engaging with somebody right off the bat that is asking for some sort of an ownership position in your company from the outset, you know, we're going to take $30,000 and 30% of your company in order to move you forward, then I urge extreme caution with that. And by the way, I have worked with clients who have entered into those kinds of engagements before. Exactly that way. You know, it's $30,000. Uh, we're going to do A, B, and C for you, and we get 30% of your company. 
I, and I just shake my head in wonder when they do that. If you find somebody that wants that first engagement to be with you know, any sort of equity compensation, and especially a large amount of equity compensation, then my encouragement to you is to run for the hills because that person's not looking out for you and your best interests at all, in my opinion. I generally encourage you not to go into hour, hourly contracts on very large projects because your contractor is at least subconsciously motivated, if not consciously motivated, to take longer than they would normally do. Um, you know, I believe in fixed, when there's a fixed scope associated with the engagement, that that's the time that you can have a fixed uh, fee contract in place. And we do that at our company in some of our engagements. You know, when it comes to business plans and financial models in particularly, we've done so many of them. We know how to control the engagement so that we you know, don't work on an hourly basis in those cases. On other things, by the way, we work on an hourly basis. When the scope is not defined, then we work on an hourly contract and by the way, there's always an out with those. I strongly encourage you to reward your contractors when your goals are being achieved, and that means making a part of their compensation leveraged on you attaining your goals and what you want to achieve. And to get the right contractors, ask for referrals from your network, from the people you really trust. Ask them, who are you working with as a securities attorney? Who are you working with as a business coach or a consultant? Who are you working at to do your graphics worth? So you at least have a great referral in there, which, which gives you some sort of social proof before you engage their services. But today, if you don't have anybody in your network who can offer those kinds of referrals, there are some matching services and crowdsourcing services available. Crowdsourcing is when you go to someplace like Fiverr or 99designs or Upwork, which used to be called Elance and you can interview many, many contractors at once. And you can see you know, what their approval rating has been from other people who have engaged their services you know, through those different sites can be a really good safety valve for you. I've done all three of those before. I've hired people from Fiverr, I've hired people from 99designs, and I've hired people from Upwork, which are three different crowdsourcing sites. And of course, I've hired people um, on the referrals of some of the people that I know and trust. So here's the bottom line. The bottom line is you need to be proficient at hiring, managing, and terminating the contractors in your network. The agreements that you have are really quite important, and they grow in importance with the size of the engagement. Just as we say with employees, it's important to hire slow and fire fast. By hire slow, that means multiple interviews at multiple times of the day by mute, multiple people and fire them fast. The first sense that you get that an employee is not going to work out, hopefully within the first 90 days or so, that you let go of them very quickly. The same thing is true with your contractors. Work with people that you trust and who are committed to your success. In the context of the Awaken CEO system we talked earlier about, talking about mindset for business growth, professional growth, and personal growth, and methods for business growth and professional growth. With regards to the mindset, I really want you to embrace working with contractors. They really are essential to your growth and success, and believe that you can learn at being very good at engaging their services and at managing them. When you have that positive mindset, it really kind of an, oh boy, I get to work with other contractors. I get to hire professionals who can help me with my business. Um, and I get to work with some really fantastic people out there. And I can learn and I will learn how to vet them properly, how to engage their services properly, how to work with them properly. When you embrace it with that kind of a mindset for business growth and professional growth, you're going to be far more successful. And in addition to that, I encourage you to embrace the mindset that you're going to get over whatever resistance that you have. Work with your coaches, work with your therapists if necessary to get over the resistance that you have in hiring with and working with contractors. Um, and for methods, we did talk about some huge methods today. Use a systematic approach that you can do to define the work to be done for vetting your possible suppliers and managing your contracts and get people on your team 
who, who, who have great experience with working with contractors to help you minimize your mistakes. Those are two great methods that you can have. And here's a really great method for you when it comes to professional growth, and that is plan on learning from every contractor that you hire. Learn how to work with them. Learn how to learn a lot more about their domain of expertise. Don't just hire them to do the job. Hire them to, to grow yourself professionally while they are doing the job for you. Ask them why. Ask them how. Learn from them so that, they, so that you can increase your own professional competence and you'll be better off in your business in the long term. That's been our agenda for today. We talked about teamwork. We talked about contractors versus employees. We talked about common mistakes that I've seen people make whenever it comes to hiring and working with contractors. We talked about the perfect storm. We talked about best practices, and we summed it all up to the bottom line. So here's what I want you to do. Get an experienced advisor on your team, somebody that can help you form a great team. In fact, I say the most important question in business is who can I get on my team to help me form a great team and that it comes with, for employees and that comes for contractors especially. Develop your growth strategy and your budget and design your own hiring engagement process much like the one that we talked about today and then use it and be very very careful. Don't go writing those $5,000 checks, those $10,000 checks, those $30,000 checks. Don't be giving away equity positions in your company until you know, it's, it's just exactly the right thing to do for you. If you want more information, we've had several different related office hours presentations, number 27 on working with attorneys, number 48 on excellence in project management, number 68 on great agreements, 95 on best practices in staffing, 103 on how to be a great leader, and number 135 on taking complete responsibility for the success of your business. In just a minute, we're going to go into open Q&A and coaching, where we entertain comments and questions on the topic of the day and then any other issues that you might have. I want you to tell me what your biggest takeaways are and what insights are that you got from this presentation, and tell us what you're going to focus on. Here at the Hoyt Management Group, we offer a wide variety of subcontracting, contracting support services. In some cases, we will teach you how to do it for yourself with our education and training programs. In some cases, we will do it with you, like business, business plans, financial models, product, develop, product funnels, sales scripts, etc. And in some cases, you can just throw it over the wall and we will do it for you and we will do a great job for you paying attention to, to your budgets, what you really need for your business, what you can really afford, what you can really use, etc. Our support systems are focused on business growth and on personal growth and on professional growth with the Awaken It CEO system for integrated growth. We do have programs for all of these nonens, for all of these different areas, all of the intersection points in between the areas of growth, the business growth, professional growth, and personal growth, and in between the levels of performance for your mindset, your methods, and your momentum. I think that that makes us unique. I've never talked to anybody out there who had a business who did all of these things for our clients. The reason we do them, by the way, is because we know that you need all of these things in order to build a profitable and sustainable and scalable business and in order to reach your potential and be the best person that you can be. With that in mind, we encourage, encourage you to join us for an awakened conversation. We are starting a webinar discussions on just the awakening part of being an awakened CEO and with group coaching and mastermind program emails for announcements. Our next office hours is going to be next Monday, October the 17th. I haven't decided what I'm going to talk about yet. So if you have some suggestions for us, let us know what topics you would like for us to discuss at paulsurvey.com. And in between the time that we talk again, do your homework. And with that, we're going to open it to up to questions and answers and coaching, where we're going to entertain first comments and questions on the subject matter of the day. And with a reminder that best question or comment wins. With that, Stephanie, do we have any comments or any questions Oop, for today? We sure do. Awesome. First one. 
does it help to know what your own hourly worth is, and then when you find yourself doing that work um, that you could pay somebody less for, that you really need to hire a contractor? That is a really great question. And the answer is yes, it really does. Now the question then is, you know, how do we determine what our hourly worth is? Uh, there are a lot of different ways of doing that. I'm going to give you one off the top of my head. Let's say that um, you're a coach. And as a coach, um, you know that you're, you're wanting to bill 20 hours a week on various coaching assignments. Your goal is to make, you know, um, $100,000 a year. That means if you're going to bill 20 hours a week for 50 weeks a year, that's a thousand billable hours. If you're going to bill, you know, if you want to, your goal is to make a hundred thousand a year. That says that, you know, we are we going to charge our services out at a hundred dollars an hour minimum. Now, by the way, most coaches find it difficult to bill 20 hours a week, so you might consider 125 dollars an hour as, as a, an appropriate hourly fee for your services. So that's your worth. You know, that's what you're worth to somebody else, a hundred or $125 an hour. If you realize that, Hey, I'm spending half of my time on marketing administration and half of my time on delivering my services, then you might say that my worth is $50 an hour because I'm going to work 40 hours a week and I want to bill half of my time. So, you know, by definition, my time is worth $50 an hour. If you can hire somebody at $10 or $15 an hour to do something that you would normally do, it is well worth your money to do that. So go hire those people at $15 an hour. Believe that if you're hiring them at $15 an hour, that will free up your time, which is worth $50 to $100 an hour, to go do the things that you need to do, the marketing, the sales work, the high level administrative work, um, to engaging with, with employees, engaging with contractors, managing the people on your team, and delivering services to your clients and customers. So absolutely know what your worth is, and then whenever you see the opportunity to hire somebody else at a less rate than you would, you, you would in essence pay yourself to do those things, then by all means, be optimistic, be proactive, hire those people, especially people that you can hire at $10, $15 an hour to do the things that you would value your own services at at $50 or $75 an hour. And by the way, if you want to make $200,000 a year and you know that you're only going to be able to bill 15 hours a week, then you know, your hourly wage, your hourly worth is maybe a hundred to $150 an hour instead of just $50 an hour. And you should hire people to do a lot more than somebody who considers their hourly worth to only be $50 an hour. Hopefully that, that helped and work with you. You know, as a CFO and an analyst, I have these conversations with my clients all the time. So I'm eager to have a more detailed conversation with you on that subject. Thanks for that question. Next question, Stephanie. Okay. 50K a year works out to $24 an hour, so I should be outsourcing jobs that I wouldn't pay $24 an hour for. So $50,000 a year it is, is essentially $24 an hour, but, but I'm thinking that your worth is higher than that because $50,000 a year at $24 an hour Assumes that you're assumes that you are billing 2,020 hours a year, and that almost never happens in a small business. You know, like I say, most co most coaches and contractors are lucky if they're billing 20 hours a week. If you're billing 20 hours out of the 40 hours that you're working, or 30 hours out of the 60 hours you're working, if you're billing half time, you're among the top 10 or 20 percent of contractors. Most contract, and by the way, you can do that if you take a long-term contract. So I, I, I think my frame of reference there was more on somebody that engages with a lot of clients at the same time, you know, that has you know, four or five or ten clients at the same time and is constantly having an inflow of clients, clients that we're beginning to do services with and clients who we've completed doing services with, then it's difficult for you to work more than more than 50% of the hours. But there are contractual relationships, 
for example, I'm building a building or I'm a computer programmer and I got a 12 month engagement or some other type of engagement where there's extremely long engagements where you may find yourself billing out 80% of your time or even 100% of your time. In that case, $50,000 a year does equal $24 an hour and it does make sense for you to hire somebody at $10 an hour because you can go bill that $24 an hour. If you're working instead with a lot of customers at the same time, then it's, then it's very likely that you're not billing 50, 40 hours a week. It's much more likely that you're billing 20 hours a week and your per hourly value is much higher than that $24 an hour. It may be more like $50 an hour or $60 an hour. So the, the reference point becomes a little bit different for that. Hopefully that was helpful to you and not too confusing to the listeners. Um, next question, Stephanie. Okay. Aren't uh, background checks expensive? Do I need to do them with everybody? Background checks can be expensive. I see them range anywhere from um, you know, $100 to $500 is generally a rule of thumb depending upon what people do for the background checks. Typically somebody that's just going to do a $100 background check is just going on the internet or they maybe they've got a library of services that they use, you know, just to go see if there's any, you know, if somebody's got a criminal record somewhere. If somebody's doing $500 background checks, they may actually be checking references for you. They may actually be calling and having a conversation with that contractor on your behalf. Typically somebody that charges $500 for a background or reference checks is doing a lot more than somebody that provides a hundred dollar an hour reference check. And generally speaking, you know, I strongly encourage you to check your references, which is a sort of a background check itself. If somebody can provide three references, then by all means actually call those references and engage with those people and find out, you know, how did they use their services. I'm oftentimes surprised about people that will throw out references knowing that the person that they provide the references to is never going to call them. I have gotten calls from people before that says that, you know, hey, John Doe gave me your name and number as a reference for services, and I for the life of me can't figure out why they gave people my name because I was unsatisfied with their work because I fired them in some way. I've actually had people you know, and I, I've had people say, ask me, can I give you a, your name and number as a reference? And I say, you know, John, that's up to you. But when they call me and ask me for a reference, I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm going to tell them that I was not satisfied with our relationship. You're welcome to give me your, give them my name and number if you like, but I don't think it's going to be favorable to you. You know, I'm surprised at the number of people who ask for references and then never call them. I'm oftentimes surprised at the number of people who give people reference names and numbers and it's not going to be favorable to them because most people don't follow up on them. So whenever you follow up on your references, that is a form of background check. That's a form of credibility check. It's a form of verifying the social proof that somebody provides to you. So I encourage you to do that. If somebody is going to handle money at your firm, if they're going to be a book, not a bookkeeper, but a bookkeeper who actually pays bills, if they're going to be handling payroll for you, if they're going to be a CFO, if they're going to have any rights and privileges for encumbering your services in any way, if you're going to give them a credit card and say to them, you know, go ahead and pay for this stuff with a company credit card, then I think it's important for you to check their background and make sure that they don't have, you know, some sort of issue. I did find... One of the, the firms that I was working with was looking at hiring a CFO for their firm, a person who represented themselves of being a partner in an accounting firm here in California. They were a partner in a CPA firm here in California, which, by the way, we verified that that was true. And then I caught wind that this person wasn't who they said that they were. And we went and started taking a look and this person who was going to be a CFO at one of my clients' companies 
had been had served time in the state penitentiary for embezzlement and fraud, that they had felony convictions to their name, and here they were saying that they were a partner in a CPA firm and positioning themselves to be a CFO at a company that was raising capital. Now, by the way, that that in, that in turns out to be incredibly important to a firm who was raising capital, because if somebody had said, if, if they didn't disclose that, and by, the, and by the way, somebody with a felony can't be a principal in a company who is raising capital in any ways. They can't be involved in the capital raising process in any way, and especially somebody who has a felony for embezzlement fraud, for example. You know, all of the companies, all of the money that that company raised could have had to be refunded to the investors. They could go, you know, the state could come in and, and give them a, a right of rescission, which means that you have to give all your money back to your investors if they want their money back. You know, it could make that entire offering be illegal because they didn't disclose that. And strangely enough, here in California, somebody can be a partner in a CPA firm without being a CPA. And of course, this person wasn't a CPA. They weren't even an accountant, but they did have a partnership interest in a CPA firm, but they were misleading. They were, they were essentially telling people that they were a partner in a CPA firm, knowing full well that people would think that that means that they're a CPA when they weren't anywhere close to that. So that was an absolute disaster, a narrowly averted disaster that I found out through, I think just through luck of noticing his guy's name on some website somewhere when I did internet research and finding out that he had been convicted of embezzlement and fraud and had served time in a penitentiary. A really good example of how important it is for you to do background checks and litigation checks uh, whenever you're hiring somebody at your firm who can represent you legally in any way or who is handling your money in any way at your firm. Again, the higher the risk, the more, the more uh, money you should be willing to spend to mitigate that risk at your company. Hopefully that was helpful and hopefully that was a good warning for you before you go hire a partner at your firm who can, by the way, legally obligate the firm in some way, or before you go hiring a CFO at your firm, especially if they've had any rights and privileges of handling the money at your firm, make sure that you are really satisfied with who they are, that you've checked your references, you know, before you, before you turn over the keys to the kingdom or before you give them the combination to the vault. Stephanie, we got one minute after. I think we got turn, time for one more question. Um, do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Last one. Um, what is the biggest mistake you've made when hiring subcontractors? The biggest mistake that I have made when hiring subcontractors involved really not vetting them out. Of knowing somebody for a few months, you know, in this particular case that I'm thinking about, I wrote them a really nice size check, many thousands of dollars, because I had had a personal relationship with them that was very favorable. They were a really nice person. I really liked them. I liked who they were, you know, and we had met at a really great organization, and, you know, I just felt very comfortable in that relationship. But I didn't do the background checks. You know, I didn't check the references. And as a result, I lost many thousands of dollars because, as it turns out, I'm a nice guy and I get along with pretty much everybody, no matter what kind of a you know, scumbag that they might be to other people, I have a tendency to have great relationships with them. And that was a big lesson for me, that people show up when they work with me at their very best because I show up with a tremendous amount of positive energy and it brings the positive energy out of them and they show up at their best because I'm showing up at my best and we just have these wonderful, friendly, kumbaya moments. Um, but I learned the hard way, a lesson that cost me many, many thousands of dollars, is that does not eliminate the need for me to do my own background checks and my own reference checks because, you know, I could be tricked. I could be 
you know, a, a person that I'm dealing with might really intend to provide the products and services that I engaged with them to provide, but they have no capability of doing so. They have no capability of providing the types of services I want. So that was the biggest mistake that I made. It cost me many, many thousands of dollars and a lot of angst because my friend did not show up. If I had to check the references, if I had to check their background, I think I would have found out that they weren't showing up for other people too, and my friend would still be a friend, and we wouldn't have gotten into that mess in the first darn place because I'd have never hired them. That was the biggest mistake that I have made. With that, that's the end of our question. Stephanie, we need to pick one of those questions for somebody who wins the prize for today. Uh, do you have any of those questions that you would consider to be the favorite? Um, I think that that Nicholas asked some asked a couple of really good had some good feedback and a couple of good questions. Awesome, awesome. All right, we will pick Nicholas as our winner. For those of you who tune in, you'll be know that you can win a prize. In this particular case, Nicholas, I think the right thing for him would be uh, you know an hour's worth of services to see what we can do to help him move forward in his business in some way and that's quite a good value depending upon what the services end up being. And with that I want to thank everybody who tuned in live and those people who are listening to the recording. Um, we uh, love the opportunity to work with you to help you move your business forward in the areas of business growth, professional growth, and personal growth. So on behalf of Stephanie May, this is Paul Hoyt wishing you until we see you again. Wishing you a most marvelous and prosperous day. Bye-bye.